Okay. <clears throat> so welcome everyone. Um, this is the second seminar in our BQE, Brooklyn Quant Experience Lecture Series here at Camden Finance and Risk Engineering Department. So um, as I mentioned last week, in case you attended, all of these videos are being recorded and um, uploaded to YouTube. So actually we just um, uploaded the video from last week. So in case you missed it and want to see it, you can go to YouTube and, um, and get it. So um, let me, um, I actually, let's see, oh, there it is. Okay, yeah, I am ready to show you the, uh, the video from last week. So as you see, you go to YouTube, hit play, of course, you'll see the video called Quantifying Model Performance from last week. Okay, okay. so I just want you to know that it's there. Um, the easiest thing is obviously go to YouTube and just do a search. So the speaker last week was Alexander Antonov. Okay, so um, the um, the ground rules for tonight and for every night will be, the speaker has graciously um, allowed questions. And so um, you can either just jump in by unmuting yourself if you feel it's an opportune time to ask a question, or if you're too shy, feel free to use the chat and, um, you know, compose your question and then um, we'll do our best to, you know, ask it at the appropriate time. So, okay, um, so I want to um, introduce our speaker. Um, so our speaker is John Hill. Um, he um, is, uh, I worked with John at Morgan Stanley and uh, I was very impressed with uh, his skills, and so I so I also asked him to teach in the Tandon program, and um, I'm not the only one who's impressed. He uh, leads the New York chapter of the Model Risk Managers International Association, has over 20 years of experience in diverse areas of quantitative finance. He's recognized as a subject matter expert in model risk management, governance, and validation, and that's what we're going to hear about tonight, and is the author of numerous publications on these topics. As I mentioned, he's also an adjunct professor in FRE. Uh, and he teaches a graduate course in advanced model risk management, governance, and validation. He has a PhD in biophysics from the University of Utah. He's a frequent speaker and chairperson at uh, model risk conferences throughout the US and Europe. And I believe he's gonna tell us about a talk he has planned. So with that, I'd like to turn over the screen to, to you, John. Feel free to share screen and take it from here. See if I can get this right. Okay, so it's working great. Can you hear me? Yes, we're hearing you. All right, I want to go into slideshow mode now from the beginning. So, as, as Peter mentioned, my area of uh, subject matter expertise of late is model risk management, uh, mostly in finance, but um, my presentation today is based on some painful lessons I learned in my last uh, job uh, regarding model governance and in particular uh, about uh, keeping model inventory. So a lot of these, um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with what a model is in terms of a software implementation of some quantitative methodology, but I'm going to assume most of you are not familiar with the uh, procedures for model risk management and risk mitigation as practiced in, in, in the financial in industry in leading banks, uh, which is an area that I am familiar with. So I'll spend a little bit of time just explaining uh, what the requirements are. And then I'll proceed to what I view, what I discovered was a, a very serious shortcoming in the way things were being done and a proposed solution. And that is why I put this title, a smarter model risk management discipline will follow from building smarter models. Because I'm going to make the point that in many ways, the most sophisticated models that are used in finance are still basically dumb in one very <laughs> essential aspect. Uh, Peter's, Peter's snickering already, but he's very familiar with models. And I'm gonna show you later exactly what's missing from our models. Okay, so uh, this is, you've already heard about me and who I am. So let me just start out with the basics. What is a model and what is model risk management? A quick review. Sorry, went the wrong way. Um, I cannot see over on the right-hand side now. I need you have to move that um, oh, menu. No. It's probably blocking you. Yeah. Um, can you see my cursor, by the way? Yes, we can. Okay, so you can point to things. So 
I'm going to start with the Bible that's used in, in model risk management in the financial industry in the U.S. and mostly as a guide in Europe as well. It's called SR 11-7 slash OCC 2011-12. This was issued by the FRB uh, jointly with the OCC in April of 2011. It's a 21-page document and it set the bar for model risk management at all conforming banks. Now, I'm only going to pick a few highlights from this document, but here's a direct quote where it defines a model. For the purposes of this document, the term model refers to a quantitative method system or approach that applies to statistical, economic, financial, or mathematical theories, techniques, and assumptions to process input data into quantitative estimates. Notice the word estimates there that will play a strong role in what we're about to talk about. A model consists of three components. I'll just abbreviate it. Input, processing, and output. Um, so that's what we made by a model. Now, there are five key takeaways I want to uh, make you aware of for specifically about model risk management and finance as laid out in SR 11-7. One, all financial models employ approximations that are based on assumptions. Therefore, model risk can never be completely eliminated, but it can be mitigated to a certain extent. Model validation, which many of you may have heard about, is a process that concentrates on the risks within a quantitative model. The purpose of validation is determined not really whether the model is right in the sense of a principle of physics, but whether it is just useful for the intended application. Model governance addresses on governance on the other hand addresses the risks outside and between quantitative models within a firm's model ecosystem. I use this term model ecosystem because that's the best way I know of to capture the notion that models mostly do not run standalone in finance. Models have dependencies on other models, on sort of, uh, upstream models that produce data input, and they provide their output yet to, to other models. So there's a network of independency, uh, interdependency within the model ecosystem. Governance really has to impact every phase of a model's life cycle, and validation is just one of them. I'll give a diagram of the life cycle of a model uh, next. A robust model governance framework will provide complete coverage for policies, procedures, roles, responsibility, ownership, control, compliance, model validation. In other words, everything beyond model validation uh, that is involved with managing models and creating a good, a strong model dis discipline. And essential among that is not only the documentation and model risk assessment, but model inventory. Model inventory is a strict requirement of SR 11-7, which mandates that all firms should have a complete and accurate inventory of their, of their set of models. Now, it seems like that should be an easy thing to do. Turns out the devil is in the details. Uh, Norify, the biggest challenge for model inventory is what, just ensuring accuracy and completeness at almost all firms. This is performed through a manual process called attestation, which literally means raising their hand and attesting to ownership. This is a diagram uh, of the typical life cycle of a model, um, identification and initiation, development and testing, uh, independent validation, which is the gateway that, uh, uh, it, it's really the, the gatekeeper that allows a model to go into production. So it's very critical, central part of the process, implementation and entry into the model inventory, followed by maintenance, change management and ongoing monitoring throughout the life of the model, and ultimately model retirement. And independent validation is this detailed technical review of a model's fitness of purpose. The point here is governance covers every phase of the model's life cycle. So five of the most daunting challenges uh, that involve uh, model risk management also are related to inventory. I have a paper that I'll mention at the very end, uh, which I the title of which is the 14 top challenges for today's model risk management managers. But here are five that I'm most concerned with in this presentation. SR 11-7 requires banks to create and maintain an accurate inventory of all models, complete and accurate. SR 11-7 also requires banks to be able to aggregate model risk across the firm. This in turn requires an understanding of those interdependencies within the firm's model ecosystem that I mentioned earlier. Why? Because an error in one model can propagate to other models through those, that network of interdependencies. And traditionally model validation has only focused on individual models, not on the interdependency between them. So understanding model and data interdependencies within that firm's model ecosystem 
can be especially problematic because mapping dependencies will rely on multiple levels of attestation. John, um, I have a comment. Uh, bullet point two, you have to aggregate model risk. So should I as a quant interpret that as model risk is a number and these numbers need to be added? Uh, this is a really good question. It's worthy of another presentation. It's very difficult to quantify model risk in finance. So most, I mean, most firms use a combination of qualitative and quantitative metrics. Some of the quantitative metrics might be uh, exposure uh, of a pricing model, but there are so many types of models, for instance, that don't have exposure at all, but they do have dependency on other models. So most firms will create a grid and rate their models depending on their dependency, their complexity, exposure to come up with a scale. And ultimately that gets reduced to what we call a RAG status, red, amber, mm -hmm. green, for model risk. And that's what can be aggregated because it's easy to aggregate colors. But okay. it sounds, by the way, your answer sounds like a model for model risk, which itself is a risk. But anyway, I'll just let you go on. Okay. <laughs> I always like to um, to reduce the summary report of model risk that went up to uh, the board risk committee and the senior managers to a heat map which was just populated with colors. And then I could sort the colors, red being the areas of greatest concern, that would be usually the focus of the meeting. So um, we have to understand these model interdependencies to really be able to aggregate model risk. And uh, to get back to Peter's point, if you're familiar with models like VAR and op risk and credit risk, those can be reduced to dollar values and therefore aggregated, but not model risk. It's uh, it's too diverse and complex to reduce to a, a dollar value, although some firms attempted to do that unsuccessfully. Now, virtually every financial firm tries to satisfy these requirements for rigorous model risk management through what I call verbal attestation. That means voluntary declarations by model owners and stakeholders, which are developers, supervisors, and users. Now, because this attestation is a manual and error-prone process, it's questionable if any true firm can truthfully claim to have a complete and accurate model inventory, much less a complete map of model and data interdependencies. And yet this is an expectation of bank examiners. To illustrate this dilemma, I want you to consider the eight vexing questions that bank examiners might pose to a model risk manager. Um, one hour, several hours before a major bank exam when I was uh, in charge of governance at uh, Credit Suisse, I just sat down and to try to calm myself, I wrote down the, the questions I was most afraid of. And that's what I present to you. And I noticed that these questions didn't have anything really to do with validation because we've been doing validations for 10 years. It was pretty mature and we we're pretty comfortable with our methodology. So here's the first question I was really troubled by. What is the exact number of different models that you have been, that have been used over the last year? Question number two. How often has each model been executed? By day, by month, by year? Can you identify the most frequently and least frequently executed models? Where are the firm's models being used? By business unit, legal entity, and geographic regions. Can you provide a complete list of the models used by each of the above entities over the last year, as well as all upstream, downstream model and data dependencies? Are there any models in your inventory with an active status that were not act executed during the year? You can imagine a, a model risk manager throwing up his hands and saying, if it wasn't executed, how would I know? But that question terrified me. And the questions like this do come up in bank exams. Are there any models that were executed on any of your firm's computers that do not appear in inventory? Uh -huh. <laughs> Please, listening. <laughs> and you may think that shouldn't happen, but trust me, it does. Are you able to provide a full list of the IDs, that's the identification, unique identification number of models that exhibit significant seasonality? If so, what are the peak and troughs of seasonal model usage? And last, and this is a killer, were there any instances of a retired model still being executed during the last year? And again, you pull your hair out and said, if it's been retired, how would I know? Uh, well, I'm actually gonna propose a solution to this, but that, that uh, will, will be revealed. Now, I would claim it shouldn't be so difficult for financial firms, I'm gonna move, move this thing out of the way. Uh, for financial firms to give accurate quantitative answers to these types of questions, but it is. Uh, I realized when I wrote these questions down that there was no resource either in Morgan Stanley or Credit Suisse, there's no database I could go to that would tell me about these dynamics of model usage, the how, what, where. 
what we knew all about the models, we knew what they did, we knew where they failed, uh, how they performed under stress testing, but we didn't even know all the people who were using them. And that, that may seem incredible, but it's true because many of these models go into an analytic uh, uh, library and that library can use, be used by anyone throughout the firm who has access to them. And unless they call up the owner and ask questions, the owner of the model wouldn't know that uh, anyone is using, uh, who's using that model. Um, the only way firms can answer these questions is through attestation by model owners and users, but they're often no better than educated guesses. So as a result, there are often discrepancies between what is an inventory and what model owners have attested. Um, I would have to, if I were presented with those questions, any of those questions in a bank exam, when I was at Credit Suisse, I would have had to simply said, um, I'll get back to you tomorrow. And naturally the banker examiner is gonna say, why do you have to wait until tomorrow? And I would say, because the people in Singapore are asleep and I have to call them, the model managers up over there and ask them how often their models are being used. And I'm gonna never get anything better than a finger in the wind guesstimate. Now, shouldn't there be a better way than this manual attestation by model stakeholders? Well, that was my dilemma. Resolving these ownership discrepancies required numerous iterations, which I had to do as a manager of the model inventory at Credit Suisse through the manual attestation process, continue sending back emails to model owners saying, this is the list of models that our database says you own. And they would come back and say, yeah, 14 of those are mine, but two of them are not, and I have no idea who owns them. And then I'd look in the database and there's no owner listed at all because the owners had moved on. Uh, particularly problematic also are the upstream and downstream dependencies between models. Model owners often do not have a complete knowledge of all of the downstream models that receive their models output as input. Again, that may seem paradoxical, but that's the reality because models are developed in different silos within a firm and the owners of the model don't always know who's using their models. They probably know some of the users because they'll get questions about them. So uh, it, it, to me, it would just seem a, a paradox that in an age of autom automation, machine learning, and big data, we really should ask ourselves, can we not find better ways to make firm-wide model and data usage more transparent? And then I started thinking about tech firms and how tech firms handle this very same problem with their smart devices. So I'm gonna take a little flight of fantasy here. Uh, so I'm gonna say that perhaps some of the answers to these questions may be found by engaging a model in a conversation. This manual attestation could be both clumsy and error prone, as I said. Models can be overlooked in the process. Some may be orphans because the owners have moved on. Others just simply fall through the cracks of antiquated systems. But hey, if models could only talk, perhaps they could help us out and give us some advice about how to better understand how, when, and where they're being used. So, this is my idea of a conversation with a somewhat snarky model. And it might go something like this. So that's a model risk manager on the left with a megaphone. He says, hey model, could we have a little talk? Model says, sure, but you may regret it later. Model risk manager says, why? Some of my best friends are models. And the model says, you MRM guys are not really <laughs> crayons in the box, are you? Still living in the stone ages. And actually MR says, whoa, singer. We thought we were leading edge. Why would you say such a thing, model? MRM, the model says, MRN spends so much time and effort collecting inaccurate, error-prone manual attestations from model owners and users just to inventory which models are being used. That is so 20th century, model says. But you could make your life so much easier if you would just reverse the manual paradigm. Reverse the paradigm, it's simpler, more accurate, and quite frankly, really kind of obvious. The model risk manager still doesn't get it. Uh, tell me, my friend, how can MRM possibly reverse a paradigm that's been in place for years at all major firms? The model says, the solution is all around you and every smart device that you use every day. It's in printers and computers, cars, smartphones, email, data networks. All you have to do is look. And this is exactly the dilemma I presented myself with. Uh, MRM says, well, I still don't get what you're driving at. Okay, the model says, listen carefully, dingbat. These devices all know who they are because they have unique IDs and a means of broadcasting, which I don't have. If you would just give me an embedded ID token and some kind of voice, then I could tell you how, when, and where I'm being used. And you wouldn't have to spend time making phone calls to model owners. This is so obvious. Model risk manager said, okay, now I think I'm getting it. All I have to do is teach you your name and how to talk. Is that right? Oh my God, it's an epiphany, but uh, exactly how would I go about doing that? 
the model says, here how, just follow the rest of this presentation and maybe it'll start to sink in. So models just smart enough to report their usage could address many of those shortcomings and answer all those eight questions that I put forward earlier. So the root cause of these difficulties is not hard to find. Our models, and I'm talking about models in finance, no matter how sophisticated their algorithm and implementation are nevertheless rather dumb when compared to an HP printer or an iPhone. A smart model should be able to report who it is, how, when, and where it is being used, and which upstream models it depends on. I always think of the example of the HP printer that I have. It's a smart printer. Every time I print anything out, that printer sends its IP address and a, 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 a message to HP headquarters or some central database that keeps track of usage, telling them how many pages I printed and what my current ink level is, so that when I get low on ink, they can send me a new ink cartridge and I don't have to remember to order it or which one I need. And that, that's really clever. And HP is doing this for hundreds of thousands of printers all over the world. Even the largest firms will have no more than three or 4,000 models. So it doesn't seem like an intractable problem. A smart model should also be able to report which upstream models it depends on. Designed correctly, smart models could eliminate this need for a manual attestation process. Now, I say below, when I say dumb models are dumb, I don't mean because they don't have smart algorithms. I mean, they lack any rudimentary form of self-awareness. To understand why, what is missing from financial models that makes them rather dumb, we really only have to dig just a little bit deeper by looking inside the source code. Look inside the source code for a complex financial model and what will you find, regardless of the programming language. So what is it that smart devices like printers, iPhones, and Tesla vehicles have that model fi financial models do not have? Well, as I said, they have very sophisticated algorithms, ef efficient optimized coding, very likely the latest concepts in object-oriented design, code for efficient dynamic memory management, what they don't have. And what you won't find as a general rule are some very simple lines of code that look like this. Model ID equal, unique model ID, model version number equal, integer, model usage ID, which describes how that particular model is being used, and the name of the model. Just four simple lines, but you won't find that in any software model used at any major bank today. That information is maintained externally to the model. So the lesson from the previous slide is simply this. Financial models do not know their own ideas. The way my smartphone knows its own serial number is embedded in the firmware uh, and it stays permanently assigned to that particular device. Um, Tesla cars know who they are and they communicate constantly with Tesla's central headquarters and get downloads of software. Uh, Every, every computer network uses identity tokens too. An IP address is a form of identity. Software implementations are classified as models in finance or assigned unique IDs as a shorthand identifier. This has been true for at least a dozen years at financial firms. These IDs will typically appear in three places, in the model documentation, in the validation documents, and the inventory database as a lookup index. But as I pointed out in the previous slide, where this information does not appear is within the actual model source code. It's in this sense that I say these models do not know who they are. And the root cause of this opacity could be, can be traced as a single surprising blind spot in most firms' model management discipline. Adding this one piece of information to a model can create a path to mitigating or even eliminating model inventory and usage uncertainties. It's a matter of creating smart models that are enabled to tell M and M, MRM how, when, and where they're being used. So a few examples, I already alluded to this, a smartphone knows its unique serial number, a washing machine knows its serial number. Even before electronics, serial numbers were stamped on the frames of every automobile that Henry Ford manufactured, in fact, on all manufactured products. And those were identity tokens. The Uber ride service uses them. That's how you, they can track your location and you can track the location of the driver that's supposed to pick you up. Tesla has the ability to track every one of their vehicles and service at a given time. It's location, travel speed, level of charge. I don't know if this is true, but I'd be surprised if it isn't that somewhere in Tesla headquarters, there's a huge map that lights up with dots that show them where all their cars are, how fast they're going, who's using them uh, in real time, because they have a two-way communication with those cars. And Hewlett Packard printers, as I mentioned, have IP addresses and they uh, send message every time I use my printer. Uh, Hewlett Packard keeps track of my usage so they can supply me uh, with an ink cartridge. Uh, 
so the crux of the matter really is this in, in the way of explaining how things got to be this way in finance. And Peter would know this very well. In financial firms, model developers and model risk managers work in completely separate silos. Model risk managers are tasked with identifying and mitigating the holistic model risks that reside in a firm's model ecosystem. Model developers are tasked with designing and implementing and testing models that efficiently and accurately convert input data into outputs. These two groups tend to work completely independently within most firms. In most firms, models are managed and executed in a number of often incompatible execution platforms. One consequence of this silo mentality is that model developers have little interest or motivation for modifying their models to accommodate the requirements of model risk managers, who they often view as somewhat of an opposing force, because model risk managers are the guys who fail their models in validation. But if they did work together, there are just some simple changes that could be made to a firm's models that would greatly improve this model risk discipline. Two of them are embed the identity tokens that I described before and act I'll, I'll describe later what I mean by active intelligent agent into model source code to accurately track usage and support creation of a dynamic model inventory. Exchange identity tokens between interdependent models to create a dynamic map of model dependencies. That means passing tokens from upstream to downstream. Uh, I'll give a little analogy later to sports to make that clear how that works, but I can say this with complete certainty, no financial firm seems to do this today. They map their interdependencies through attestation. Smarter models could help to track model usage and map interdependencies by the identity token, the embedded identity token is completely passive. It's a necessary but not sufficient first step. Benefits will follow from what we do that embedded information and that will require introduction of an active intelligent agent into each model. In the next two slides will describe in more detail what I mean by that. So step one, embed model IDs with a model code. We already talked about this. Embedded IDs can act as identity tokens. And that's, I think, the best way to think about them. A downstream model could accumulate a collection of to tokens that uniquely identify all levels of upstream dependencies based on execution sequence rather than attestation by model owners. Token passing can trace complex interdependencies from model to model. And by the way, this is not a new idea. Uh, token passing is used all the time in email. E email messages are broken up into data packets and each data packet has its own identity token. And that, that's how the email is reconstructed when the packets arrive at their destination. There's nothing novel about this. As I said, internet computer networks and email have relied on the concept of identity tokens for decades. Step two, add what I call a transponder tracking function to serve as an embedded intelligent agent. So this is really um, inspired by the transponders that are used to track civilian aircraft, which is a similar problem, knowing where all the planes are in real time. A transponder tracking function can act as the intelligent agent that would be called once each time a model is executed. At a minimum, it should broadcast the following fields to a centralized database. That model and usage ID I mentioned, the model name and version number. The timestamp, this tells you when that model was, when that execution event occurred. A MAC or IP address, uh, the MAC address uh, stands for meter, media access control. That's the hardware equivalent of an IP address. Every computer has a unique MAC address. It's, it's again, the serial number associated with the processor. If these data were stored for every execution event for each model in inventory, that is assigned a unique ID, you end up with a treasure trove of model usage data accumulated over time. So that's the second step towards creation of a smarter model by embedding this intelligent agent that can automate usage tracking. The data can form the basic for, basis for what I call a dynamic model inventory, one that includes continuously updated information about the how, when, and where models are being used. Passing tokens from upstream to downstream entities will form the basis for the dynamic map of model and data interdependencies. Now, if you haven't worked in banks or actually seen what model inventories look like, they're very elaborate, but they're filled with static data. A lot of data about the ownership of the model, who the developers were, you know, the validation information, if there are any outstanding findings that need to be remitted, all that really important information, but it's all static. You will not find dynamic usage information in model inventories at banks today because they rely on attestation for this. So. Conceptually, this model usage tracking is really, it's pretty simple. Uh, starting over the last, you take any model with an ID, uh, 
when it's called, it, it transmits model usage and indicative data through um, the intro. Well, I would do it through the firm's intranet. That is the internal network. Uh, that's what the transponder does. It takes that data. It sends it to an intranet or temporary file. I'll explain why, why I include temporary file here. Uh, that would contain the model usage indicative and data and identity token. And then the model usage indicative data and that identity token goes into a dynamic model inventory database, which is continuously being updated. Now, why do I say temp file here? Because I actually presented this idea at Credit Suisse uh, about a year and a half ago. And um, the IT guys who heard this ID were absolutely horrified uh, by my proposal. And that surprised me. The quants really liked it. Uh, the quants in the development, the front first line defense development, they liked the idea. But the IT guys said, we have spent years building firewalls and levels of protection around our precious models. And you want to drill a hole right through it and transmit that information across the internet. And I said, internet, that means internal. We own that, right? Isn't it secure? And they would wave their hands and maybe not. It can be hacked. And I said, okay, then a workaround is you, you just dump the data into a local temporary file. And once a week, you sweep that temporary data into this dynamic database on the right. And uh, that breaks the connection, a direct connection between the actual model and the internet. But it, I, I was really surprised that the IT guys were, <laughs> they were nearly hysterical at the thought that I wanted to do this. So how do you prove something like this when it doesn't exist? So I, simulation is really one of the best ways to demonstrate the potential of an idea. It offers a practical way to establish the value that can be added by embedding model identity tokens and a transponder tracking functions. And it can be implemented without impacting anything to do with production models by leveraging a portfolio of synthetic or dummy models consisting only of these embedded IDs and transponder functions in a script that just calls them. Uh, repeatedly, and so you can start collecting that data. And so, in fact, we have done that. Uh, the graphs, and so how would results be presented? How would you put this information to something that's really useful to my model risk managers? Uh, the graphs displayed in the following slide were produced by collecting four data fields for each of 100,000 model execution events generated on 100 dummy or synthetic models with embedded model IDs and that active transponder function over simulation horizon of three and a half years. So ID, model name, timestamp, and uh, an address are the only model usage data required to produce the following kinds of graphs. Timeline plots of usage for any model or grouping of models, a histogram distribution of model execution frequencies, a global map showing concentration of model usage with sufficient history. That global map can be animated to illustrate changing usage pad patterns through time. Uh, and I'm going to show you uh, an example of that in just a minute. Um, for you code wonks out there, um, I actually was able to work uh, with a uh, consultant, a, a fellow at FI consultant named David Leonard, and he saw my, my presentation on this and he got really interested and he actually developed the simulation uh, of the transponder and he showed me this is the R code. This is, this is how much code it takes to do all that. So we're, we're talking about 12 lines of code. Uh, by the way, this would not be, the code itself would not be put into the model. The model would only have that identity token and the transponder, a call to the transponder function, um, which is this, but that transponder function would should be just part of a compiled library that gets linked in. So you don't repeat this code in every model. It's just in a library call. So this is the dashboard that David created to show the kinds of things we could do with it. Once we collect this data, which is to show these timelines of usage, a distribution of frequency of usage, and a global map of where these models, finally, a global map of where these models are being used based not on attestation, but on actual execution events. Uh, at this point, um, I, would, I put the slide in. Is there time for a video demonstration? I believe there is. Uh, so let me figure out how now I'm going to pull up my demonstration video. Okay, can everybody see this? Yes. Okay, so watch the magic. Particularly keep your, at the end, keep your eye on this global map because you're going to see something that no firm can do today. I say that with 100%. Hey, you know.
Hey, John, um, I'm not hearing you. Are you speaking? Um, okay, I think I, I need to do something. <clears throat> yeah, if you're, you're not hearing the audio. Oh, um, well, there was a silent period there. Uh, I'm not sure whether you were talking or not. And um, can you hear anyway, I'm hearing you now, obviously. So <clears throat> can you hear that? No, I'd say I did not hear anything. Okay, um, James told me how to fix this. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I know, I can remember how to do it though. Uh, do you want to share your screen and your audio? Yes, I need to activate the audio, but not the, the, the video option for the share. You know how to do that? Uh, uh, can you share your screen with us? If you go to the share screen option, you'll see these advanced sharing options. Okay, so this share screen. Oh yeah, I can help you with this, John. So click share screen and then at the top. Oh, here, over here. I have to say share computer sound. And I don't, we tried this earlier in a test and optimizing the screen didn't work too well. Okay. So I'm sharing computer sound. I think this should work now. Okay. Uh, let me know if it doesn't, but this is what I did earlier to get it to work. As a model risk manager, you know the number of your models is increasing but so are the number the of questions from your auditors. Yes, yeah, we can do it. Collaboration with John Hill created the Transponder Tool, a simple yet powerful software system designed to make your life easier. The Transponder Tool is comprised of two main components, a dashboard that lets you easily see all of your model run history and metadata, as well as a easily embeddable function that powers the entire system. Now, as you can see on the screen, the dashboard shows model run counts by date, location, and user. Likewise, each of these fields can be filtered by things like model name, model type, model language, and more. So if, for instance, auditors ask you for more information about your commodities models, you could quickly tell them when, where, and by whom those commodities models were being run. What's also helpful about the transponder tool is it captures and stores each model run and its corresponding metadata in an easily viewable and filterable log, like the one on the screen. Now, this log is actually populated every single time a model connected to your system runs. How is a model connected to your system? Well, that's the cool part. It's as easy as the two sections of code you see on the screen. The top function sits in a shared repository and contains the functionality used to send metadata to your system's dashboard. The bottom line of code simply gets embedded in the heads of each of your models, and then every time those models are run, it calls the function that we just talked about. So let's see an example in action. Imagine that this post log function was embedded in our model. When we highlight it and click run, we'll see in the console that the post log function was executed. Now when we navigate back to our dashboard and we come up here and click refresh, we'll see that our entries actually go from 100,000 to 100,001, with the latest entry being the one that the post log function just created. One final cool feature of the transponder tool is that it lets you examine modeling behavior over time. So if, say, an auditor asked you where your models were being executed, you could set a date range, hit run, and provide the auditors with an interactive visualization that answers their questions through a historical lens. So that's it. That's the transponder tool. It's simple, but extremely powerful towards the end of providing you with unprecedented insight into your modeling processes. If you'd like to learn more about our transponder tool, or if you're just interested in learning how to develop your own, let us know and we'll be in touch. Okay, so that was the video. Um, let me now go to the um, summary of what I view as the advantages, and then I'll talk about the disadvantages of using this approach in a contemporary bank. The solution advantages, the solution is inside the model. It, it, for me, it's, it's it, it, you can't overemphasize the importance of that. By putting the tracking function and identity tokens inside the model, rather than relying on, say, some execution, external execution platform to track and storage user stations, um, we will have a technology, a technique that's readily scalable and portable. 
it will work equally well for large IT controlled models like VAR, OpRisk, or small standalone and using computer models, uh, which are not run from execution platforms. It's readily scalable. If it's going to work for 10 models, it'll work for 10,000 since it doesn't require assumed consistency among external environments. It doesn't care where the model is, what kind of execution environment it's in. This transponder function will have an independent conduit to that centralized database to store usage information. It's comprehensive uh, because it's platform independent. It's a global solution that could operate on any firm computer that has access to the firm's intranet or can write results into a file. It also can be implemented incrementally. It doesn't have to be done all at once across all models within the firm. It can be implemented over time, beginning with a limited set of models, such as those used for C-card use gas, and gradually through the course of a year or more, additional models can be included in this functionality. And as I've been making a point of tracking model and data interdependencies, it offers a very different and direct token-based means for comprehensively identifying upstream and downstream dependencies based on actual execution rather than attestation. Um, I, I mentioned this because I did go through the exercise at Credit Suisse of trying to track down upstream <laughs> dependencies uh, on models. And um, you know, I would be reviewing the validation document and uh, the developer's documentation, and it would list a, a set of uh, inputs as a requirement, all the inputs should be, need to be listed. And then I call the model owner and I'd say, are you sure this, these are all the upstream dependencies? And they'd say, well, uh, we don't deal with any models that produce those inputs. In other words, an, another level of upstream dependency because we don't own that model. It doesn't concern us. We, we're, we just list the, the inputs that go directly into our model. And I realized right then that attestation was going to give a very incomplete uh, picture of upstream dependencies without a lot of legwork of tracking all of this down. The token passing from upstream to downstream model is just so much easier and is dynamic and it would update the data as the models are executed. So, uh, what about the disadvantages? Disadvantages. Um, this requires minor, minor additions in the source code of each model to be tracked. Performance won't be affected, but it does mean touching every model. And developers and IT staff tend to be loath to do things like this unless they have some incentive. And in my view, it's going to take incentive from high-level management uh, to actually require them to uh, implement this if it ever gets done. A second disadvantage could be the high bandwidth from heavily used models that could bottleneck the firm's intranet. But that can be dealt with by filtering for only the critical information that's needed. Vendor models present a special challenge. It's very doubtful vendors would agree to install these transponders in their models. But there may be workarounds because, in my experience, uh, most vendor models are called through an in-house execution script or host program. And this information could then be embedded in the host program that calls the vendor model. Spreadsheet EUC models could present some challenges, but not insurmountable. Uh, and most large established firms, though, tend to be resistant to change, especially innovation. So there'd be a lot of pushback from IT organizations. So in a nutshell, the takeaway here, embedding identity tokens and intelligent agents into models can reverse the current manual attestation paradigm, which accounts for a lot of the uh, overhead and resource requirements for model risk management at contemporary firms. In a nutshell, model attestations are just being performed backwards. As I said, MRM relies on model owners and users to identify this information. It's just so much easier and more straightforward to teach the models to provide this information directly through the internet and reverse this paradigm. and smart models will do the work for MRM. This single innovation could replace our 20th century manual attestation process. However, it is done. The most important takeaway from this presentation is that any usage tracking solution should reside inside the model code. Only in this way will it be both portable and fully scalable in all execution platforms. I'm not quite done yet. So, um, so far I've been waving my hands and talking about the wonderful things that might be. Uh, software developers have an interesting, uh, cute name for this. So they call it vaporware. Uh, and that's what it's been for the last year and a half that I've been talking and promoting this idea. But SAS has actually, the SAS Institute, if you're familiar with them, uh, SAS stands for, I think, Statistical Analysis System, but they, they do a lot more than that. The SAS Institute has actually implemented this now in their model risk platform. It was my good fortune that about a year ago, the head of their uh, MRM 
program, David Assermly heard my presentation and his light bulb went off because he'd had a, they've had an MR, a mental risk management platform for going on five years now. And one of their modules was for tracking just these dynamics of model usage, of how, when, and where the models were being used, but it relied on manual input by the model users and owners. And David said, all of our modules in the NRM get used except that one, because nobody wants to take the time to type in all this data. He said, you've just provided the solution. We can automate this whole process, populate that data. And then I know that we use it because it's, it doesn't require any extra work. And they just pull up that dashboard I showed you and learn a lot of new things about how their models are being used. So SAS has um, actually moved ahead with this, with David's encouragement, and they've created a prototype desk that implementation. Uh, th this is actually, you'll notice the SAS logo in the right. So David actually allowed me to use some slides from one of his presentations. So they're, they're using unique embedded identity tokens with a rudimentary level of self-awareness. They can be embedded in all model results. The identity tokens are passed from upstream models and data to their downstream recipients. It can be used to create a dynamic map, and that's what David's indicating over here, of model interdependencies that are updated when the firm's models are executed. The model usage data is auto-generated. It eliminates that need for manual updates. Prototype version is now available for testing by select clients, but it hasn't been advertised yet. Um, uh, oh, there is a caveat. This will only work for SAS models. That is SAS written, models written in the SAS language because they're the only models they have control over but it can serve as a proof of concept. Uh, so here's David's diagram of how they can use smart models to support model governance. Model, here's the model usage data and token passing, uh, accounting and IRS 9, accounting and finance data can be generated, uh, is generated by models. Uh, decision making, such as uh, deciding on loans, all this information can go into MRM and ultimately end up with this uh, map of independencies. Um, I, I put this in slide just as uh, my own interest, because uh, I did this at Credit Suisse, a complete mapping of upstream and downstream model with data indices is best, best captured in what's called using network theoretic approach. Um, I've seen people try to do this with hierarchies, and that's, that's very, very clumsy because hierarchies are great for one-to-many relationships. But we're talking here about many-to-many -many relationships, and the only way to plot them really in a sensible way is with this kind of network diagram. In this diagram, each little ball represents a model, the, the numbers, that the IDs are made up, and the arrows indicate which direction of dependency between these models. And I use what was called, a, this was a, created with an open license tool called GFI, or Jeffy, not sure how it's pronounced, G-E-P-H-I. It was developed in France, but it's free, uh, can be used no licensing fees for it. Uh, it's a very sophisticated tool using this globular cluster approach. It puts all the models with the greatest amount of interdependencies right here in the center, because those are the ones typically you're gonna find the, the most aggregate model risk. And the, the less dependency a model has, it will appear in the outer arms of the galaxy. I, I found this cluster approach to be very useful for presenting uh, interdependencies. Again, management loves this kind of thing because the G5, you can scroll across the, you can put thousands of models in here. It doesn't have a limit. You can scroll across it. You can zoom in to examine individual detail. A wonderful tool. Okay, so this paper, this presentation is based on a paper that I published in February. I just put this up to prove to you I really did publish it. Uh, and by the way, you can get anyone interested can send me an email request and I'll give you a copy of that paper. Uh, plus a few others that I have. So here's some recent publications. Um, that I've made um, that all deal in different ways with uh, model risk management. The first paper was Shouldn't a Model Know Its Own, a own ID, which I, I published two years ago. And um, that's where I first presented the idea of embedded intelligent agents. And the second paper I published uh, in 2019 uh, was the top 14 challenges for today's model risk managers, uh, which includes much of what I've been talking about here, but a lot of other things, it's really comprehensive uh, description of all the things model risk managers have to do today to uh, uh, create a, an effective MRM discipline. And then this last paper is what this presentation is based on. So now let me make a shameless plug. Uh, as you gather from this, model risk is an area of interest for me. So far, I've just been talking about how model risk is mitigated and managed in finance, financial models. Real interest in history. 
and um, on the 29th for Tandon Teaches, I'm going to be giving a much broader presentation in which I talk about the history of model risk going back hundreds and hundreds of years. And, and all the examples I will, I will demonstra demonstrate very recognizable forms of model risk, but none of them are finance. For instance, a major warship that capsized as soon as it was launched in 1628 in Sweden to a Mars spacecraft that crashed into the planet because someone forgot to convert English units into metric units. Uh, these are all classic types of modeling errors. And I, I've been really interested in finding these examples in non-financial applications, although I do find they're concentrated in aviation and in naval warfare. There's some really fascinating examples of the British Navy making the same mistake 68 years apart and two different, costing them, nearly costing them two different naval bottles. And then I discovered recently that the American Navy did almost the same thing. <laughs> so that's, um, that's on the 29th at noon as part of Tandon Teaches. And if you're interested in, for that presentation, I'm gonna use a much broader definition of what a model is. Here I've been focused on finance and we talk about mathematical algorithms, but I'm going to try to actually show you what the true origin of all models is. And for this, I have to go back to the Neolithic, uh, Paleolithic era and show you evidence from 35,000 years ago of how models were first created. Uh, if, if that intrigues you somehow, uh, and I hope it does, then please uh, attend that. So that's my final slide. And that ends this presentation. And let's see if there were any questions that I could answer. I have a question. Uh, sure, go ahead. Um, this is uh, David Shimko. Um, I think um, this is a very interesting idea. I think the, it reminds me though a bit of some of these um, attempts to model certain kinds of operational risk by capturing all these little tiny risks and then not being able to really manage them. And I'm concerned about materiality. Um, in one sense, you mentioned like a, a model like e to the minus RT would be something that could be filtered out because that would be too ubiquitous to be useful. But I think that um, Two exceptions I would be concerned about is what happens when you have transactions of different size that use the same model or different exposure levels where you want some kind of priority indication as to the impact of a, a model error, for example. Or when usage is not the same thing as, you know, if someone's referencing a, you know, a, a model or they're, they're checking it or they're, you know, researching it, they're not using it per se. It, it may not as qualify as, as usage when, 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 when the trigger is set to send a, a message. So I'm wondering what you think, you know, could be the role of, of the MRM department, if that is the case, if there are, if I'm right, if you, if you agree with me that there's, there's going to be a big problem figuring out which ones are the important applications and which ones are less important. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I have thought about that a lot. And I talk about it in my papers in more detail. I didn't go into the detail here. But what I recommend strongly, any firm or any group that wants to proceed along these lines, start with a very small test set of 10 or 20 models and just collect data from those for weeks or months to get a sense of how much information is going to be generated. And secondly, you're talking about which level. Um, really, that's what the, um, if, if you remember, I, I said I propose not just a, a model ID, but an application ID, a usage ID, which also can be more granular in defining which particular application this model is being used for. So that, Identity token really has a lot of room for additional information to, to refine what's being collected. And then, of course, again, I would put filters uh, because take a VAR model, for instance. Uh, a lot of the VAR models can get executed 100 times a day, uh, perhaps are the, the models that feed into them. I don't need to know that. I just need to know that this model was executed 100 times on this day. So I would just use a counter instead of collecting all that data uh, each time. So I think with experience, one can develop um, a good sense of what information is useful, what needs to be captured, and at what level of model usage. And undoubtedly, that identity token will be expanded to facilitate this. So this this is um, an initial prototype. Nobody's doing this yet, but I think if somebody implements this six months down the road, it'll look very different from my presentation today based on experience. Uh, does that help address what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. The, the part that perhaps you could elaborate on is what would you see the future role of MRM is if such an, a system were operational? Uh, this doesn't eliminate the things that MRM have to do at all. What it does eliminate is a lot of the very manual and tedious part of being a model risk manager. You know, tracking down all these models, how they're being used. Uh, model risk management can and should be focused on mitigating model risk. And this, by 
understanding how, when, and where the models are using it, you get a useful tool that tells you that. But it's not going to eliminate the function of MRM. Remember, MRM is responsible for every phase of the model life cycle. They're still responsible for all the policies and procedures that govern both model development and model validation. They're responsible for overseeing uh, implementation and, and overseeing the data, the model inventory itself. There's still a lot of tasks there, in other words. So it, it may reduce the requirements, the manual effort required, and the headcount requirements, so you get greater efficiency. Certainly does not eliminate the need for MRM. The greater threat to MRM from that point of view is machine learning and artificial intelligence. I mean, what was the, the quant who doesn't keep up with that field? Because there, certain firms are making a great deal of process and progress in using machine learning to take over the validation procedure, and that's a large part of what MRM does. Great, thank Sometimes, you very much, uh, Yeah, I, this Peter, I wanna make three points. Um, so one is that um, I used to work at Bloomberg, and um, at Bloomberg, a model was a command that you typed into the Bloomberg terminal, and um, they kept track of every time any command was used, and by who. <laughs> so let's say, so, so they're doing you know, an example of what you're talking about. Um, the second point is that, um, you know, I guess the motivation that you emphasized was uh, to be able to answer regulatory regulators' questions, and that's a valid motivation, but I can think of another one, or actually two. So, so one would be that, um, you know, for the model developers, um, when you have to pay them, uh, that you could look at how many times their models were used, okay, um, and um, pay accordingly. Um, that's actually how it worked at Bloomberg, by the way. And um, the other um, model is used rather than by, say, its impact. Well, it's hard to measure impact, so they simply it was kind of unfair too. I mean, my models were compared with the uh, MSG function, which is just like an email, okay, email command. So um, that's short for message. So anyway. Um, credit curve construction model or volatility service model uh, mainly get executed once a month to build the services, but it could be used by a lot of other. Yeah, models. but let's say you have two models, both with the design to do the same thing, and one gets hit twenty thousand times more often than the other. Um, you know, then you have a sense of which one. You know, if you have two developers who each develop one. You know who to pay. Um, and then um, the third point is that. Um, you know, I guess you were thinking that the users of the models are people inside the firm, but but it is a reality, as you know, that banks make their models available to customers, not necessarily the models the banks use themselves, but models that are developed by the bank are used by customers. And um, so then obviously you could track the usage by customers. And this does raise an ethical question. Uh, so, you know, if you know exactly which of your models are being used by customers and how often and you know you you're <clears throat> trading perhaps with them mm -hmm. uh, maybe it gives you an information edge and um so anyway so uh it's something to think about <clears throat> Yeah, I, I see that, but that's not a good reason to, to have a blind spot about how models are being used. There may be um, some effort is required for security around that, but mm -hmm. Um, and to get back to your first point that uh, you said that Bloomberg uh, tracks every every execution that occurs. Do they share that information with their clients though? No. <laughs> so they? that's used for just internally to know, you know, which functions are being used and which one's not. So, you know, if you just take the view that for Bloomberg, a function is a model. And, and secondly, is that tracking done with anything internal to the model or is it just done externally through the execution platform? It's a through the execution platform. So um, in order to call, um, you know, a, a model, you have to type a particular short phrase <clears throat> and um, they're just keeping track of how often the phrase is invoked. Yeah, so that may work okay at Bloomberg, but at, at big banks, for one, there are dozens, and at, at Morgan Stanley, there were eight, 80 different execution platforms, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, um, yeah, I agree. That's a, it wouldn't work there. I agree. I don't know if you had, you probably didn't have the proliferation of EUC models at Bloomberg that most banks have, because Bloomberg is in the business of selling models. But EUC, that's mostly spreadsheets, but it could be Python or R. These are 
models are developed by individual users on their own platform, and they tend to hide them from model risk management because they don't want to go through all the pain and agony of validation and documentation. So there are a lot of models at every firm that are literally hiding in the shadows. Mm -hmm. If I were the grandma, uh, which, which, which actually, so, um, I mean, it reminds me of something, which is that um, I know, like you were sort of drawing an analogy between models and smart phones, let's say. And so I guess I've read that Apple has a kill switch for every iPhone. <laughs> so they can actually, if they choose to remotely remove your access to your own iPhone. Yeah, uh, to my knowledge, they haven't done it. But anyway, I well, mean, a kill switch for a model that's gone rogue <laughs> wouldn't be a bad idea. <clears throat> that's an interesting idea because one of the problems yeah has that if a model fails its testing, you know, if they could throw a switch and deny usage, that's much better than just calling the guys up and say, you can't use the model anymore. Yeah. I mean, there's a famous example, isn't there, of um, night trading, I believe, last $400 million <laughs> trading on an automated model in like half an hour. And um, I'll bet they would have liked the kill switch <laughs> for that half hour. <clears throat> Any other questions? You know, I just had a quick comment. Um, I remember working on a, a, a case where there were some, some text questions about where models were developed and how they were being used. And it does impact financial institutions from a tax perspective as well. I thought you might find some advocates in the tax department to track usage for the purpose of getting better, um, uh, better accounting information. Are you talking about um, tax department within a firm or federal tax? So international taxes, like if you if you at Morgan Stanley, for example, if you have international developers who are developing models for use in the U.S., Morgan Stanley might want to take tax credits for the um, developers, and their ability to do so would be to, to, would would depend on where the models are being used. For example, well, I, I think SAS is getting at that a little bit with this diagram because they're talking about. Uh, mm -hmm accounting and finance information to the central database and that could include information about tax I mean, it's really wide open how you want to use this and what information you want to, to send but it's a good it's a good suggestion yeah it is i mean um let's say if you think of a model as a manifestation of research and um you know just from an accounting perspective you spend a lot of money paying people to develop the model um, and then you sort of, you know, all, all at the beginning, and then you want to reap the benefits over several years. You really should be doing matching. It's called an accounting, matching the expense with the with the revenue generation. And um, I can, you know, sort of see that having measures of how often the model is being used would help you to allocate the cost. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I can tell you a little anecdote that I didn't know about this when I wrote my papers, but about 15 years ago, this was done, something like this was done on a very small scale at Deutsche Bank. And there was um, a chief quant who, whose team developed an analytic library. And I don't know if it was out of paranoia, or just curiosity, but he wanted to know who was using his models because it went mm -hmm. to the library that got compiled. So he put something like this idea of a broadcast function and an ID, he buried that in each model so he could just track who was using his models and, and when. And unfortunately- I wonder if he's still tracking. <laughs> he left Deutsche Bank many years ago. And uh, anyway. He left the firm, he retired, it just died. Okay, well, it's not- Because nobody really thought <clears throat> to firm-wide tracking and realized this could work for EUC models just as well. He was just interested in his own little uh, silo of models. Um. I have a question. Sure. So, Professor Hill, I was just wondering if you could elaborate more on your opinion on why this isn't already more common, since the way you've mm -hmm. described it makes it sound like almost in, like a massive advantage for anyone who manages to implement it. And I hope I've made it sound like really obvious. <laughs> <laughs> it, my, my first shallow answer would be, it's just so damned obvious nobody noticed. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, there's a story about uh, it comes fish in the water and someone, um, another fish, the first fish, you know, out the water and goes, what water? <laughs> you know. So. But to dig in a little bit deeper, it goes back to the fact that models have been used in finance well over 50 years, probably longer than that. You know, the first option models for the 1930s or something. Um, 
And we only started, when I was at Citigroup, I worked in model uh, validation then, and up until maybe the first five years of this millennium, we didn't have unique model IDs. We just used the names. So we, we would have a, a, a file system, a fo and each folder, each model would be assigned a folder, and the name of the folder would be the name of the model. Uh, it's okay for a few hundred models, but when regulators look at this, they said, no, you got to have an online database, you know, get something more sophisticated. Then it became important to assign these IDs as an index into the database. So this idea of model ID really followed the origin of models by about 50 years. And so it would have required an effort to go back and retool the models to do what they really should have done from the very beginning. But in the beginning, they saw no need for unique IDs because everybody just used the name of the model. Uh, of course, model names are not guaranteed to be unique. Guaranteed to be unique, that's why we don't use them as the index into the model inventory. But today, every firm assigns them, but that's only maybe the last 10 or 12 years. And because they were being forced by the regulators to use more sophisticated yeah. databases. I mean, at Credit Suisse, we had 2,500 models. You can't really manage that on a spreadsheet anymore. You have to go into a SQL type of database with an ID as an index. So, so that's kind of the evolution. I, the idea of putting IDs on these models was not, it's not like manufacturing where they put serial numbers on manufactured items almost from you know in the 19th century. Uh, with models, nobody saw a need for it. And now that even if they see a need for it, they wanna go back and retool all their models to make this happen until somebody beats them over the head. I, uh, as an aside, I've been giving my presentation and sending my papers to these regulators at the FRB because I want them to start asking those eight questions because and <laughs> then yeah. say, why can't you answer any of these questions? And you know, I want the model risk managers to, to start thinking, maybe, maybe we should start doing something about this and uh, start thinking about these ideas. But it, it takes regulatory pressure very often to make any real changes in the way things are done in, in large banks. Okay. Okay, um, so I think we should wrap up. It's a few minutes after seven. Um, so I wanna thank everybody for, for coming today. Um, if you um, want to see it again, um, it should be uploaded to YouTube in about a week. And um, so I look forward to seeing you back next week. We have this every Thursday at six o'clock. And um, if you um, want to just get an email about the seminars and you're not already getting one, um, then um, you can go to a website called QFWS, that's QFWS, and sign up for it. QFWS stands for Quantitative Finance Weekly Seminar. Okay, thanks everyone, and we'll see you next week. Okay. Thanks for allowing me to speak. Okay, bye-bye.